Software Engineering Radio Episode 66 and Gary McGraw on Security. Hello, listeners. Um, welcome again to Software Engineering Radio. In this episode, Michael will interview Gary McGraw on security. But before we get started, let me again remind you of our listener survey. We have got a couple of uh, replies. A couple of people have filled in the survey forms. But um, we need more. So please, everybody, go to our website, se-radio.net, and click the link to take the survey. Again, you can uh, win a bunch of books. Wiley and D. have provided us with a couple of books, books to give away. And of course, German folks will get German books. We won't send German books to English-speaking audience. <laughs> and, well, we, 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 we won't sell the data or do anything commercially with it. We just want to know who you are to improve your experience of SE Radio, to um, optimize topics we're talking about, and so on. So please do us a favor and go to se-radio.net, click on the survey link and fill in the survey. You're doing us a great, great favor. Thanks, and now let's get on with uh, the episode today, uh, Michael and Gary McGraw. Gary is security expert and CTO of a security company. Gary, why don't you introduce yourself briefly? Well, it's good to be here, Michael. I'm Gary McGraw. I'm the CTO of Sigital. And I'm a software security expert, which is what we're going to be talking about today. Great. So so how did you get started in, in software security at all? I got started in 1996, which was about 11 years ago now. And what happened was I was very much interested in programming languages. And in particular, when Java came out, I thought that it was going to be fantastic to have a, an advanced programming language for the web. And then, of course, I got it when it was in alpha, and it turned out to be more like C++ with a few web bells and whistles thrown in than it was like my favorite programming language, which is Scheme. But I got very much interested in the claims that Sun Microsystems and others were making about Java because they were saying things like any code that you write in Java can be secure. And I thought, what in the heck are these guys talking about? So I started getting very deeply into Java security, and I ended up... Um, helping Ed Felton and the guys at Princeton um, to break the Java virtual machine many, many times. We got lots and lots of press, and, and we learned a lot of interesting lessons. And then I wrote a book called Java Security with Ed. So after that, it really made me wonder why it was that these incredible language designers and these incredible engineers like Gosling and Guy Steele and Bill Joy had screwed this up. You know, and if you were a builder of systems and you wanted not to screw things up from a security perspective, where would you turn to learn how to do that? In particular, if you were a developer, where would you turn? And you know what the answer was? The answer was there was nowhere to turn. So I decided to blaze a new trail and uh, start working on software security right about then. So I guess your best friend was Sun then, or how is the relationship? <laughs> <laughs> it turned out in the end to be just fine. In the beginning, there was a woman there named Marianne Mueller, who was a pretty good security person, but not really a software person. And when Java 1.2 came out, when JDK 1.2, which was also called Java 2, um, came out, they had replaced Marianne with a, another guy who's now a good friend of mine named Lee Gong. Lee was for a while uh, a scientist at, at Stanford Research International, SRI. And so I knew him from the scientific community, and we got on great. Um, and so did Ed Felton and all these other guys. So you know, we, we, we worked together very closely. And, of course, it wasn't just Sun stuff that was broken. We, we ended up poking holes in the virtual machines of Netscape, if you remember Netscape from back then, and also of Microsoft when Microsoft finally released um, Internet Explorer 3, which I believe was in 1998. So, um, you know, it was interesting back then. I think what happened in the beginning was they ignored us um, because they thought, oh, yeah, it's just a bunch of theory. And then the press got wind of it, and it became quite a big story, and they were forced 
to face up to the security challenges that they had, and they did a pretty good job addressing them. So I, I wonder what kind of mentality, what kind of talent do you need to break uh, VMs to, to be so interested in, in breaking other stuff? Yeah, I, you know, that's a good question. I, th I grew up that way. Um, you might have, I don't know if you have in Germany, these little cars, these toys that you put in a slot and they run on electricity. You press a button and, and the cars drive themselves around. Do you have those cars? Yeah, we have them as well. Yeah, so, so that was called a, a Aurora Racetrack in the mm -hmm. States. And uh, I had one of those cars, and the first thing I did was take the car apart and figure out how it worked. <laughs> and I figured out that it had an electromagnetic motor in there. And I also sort of knew a little bit about how those motors worked, so I took some copper wire and put a few more little lines on my motor so that it would be more powerful, and then my car would beat everybody else's car because it had a, a more powerful motor. Of course, I never told anybody about the extra lines. <laughs> <laughs> but if you if you did the wrong thing back then, if you pressed the button all the way down, the car would fly off the track because it was too powerful. <laughs> all right. But but you know I was born with that mentality. So when it when it comes to technology and it comes to especially programming things, because I've been programming since I was 16. Um, you know I actually 15, 1981. I I've I've always wondered. Um how things really work and, and what you can do to learn about how they work and and, and uh, take them apart. Okay, so I, I see. So how does it uh, help you uh, today as a security expert? How, how does your typical day look like? Uh, are well, you I'm, not sure I, I'm not sure I have typical days for a security guy because, you know, because I wrote Java Security and then I followed it up with a book in 1999 called Building Secure Software, And then I have one in 2004 called Exploiting Software, and I had another one in 2006 called Software Security. Um, my books are pretty popular, so I've become kind of a famous security guy. And so I think my life is not very typical. <laughs> Mostly so, what I find myself doing these days is flying around planet Earth and telling people what I wrote down in the book and that they didn't want to read. They wanted me to tell them instead. So you let other people uh, try to break uh, others' code and... Well, we, you know, we do a lot of deeply technical work when, when we're working on a book. For example, I have a new book we'll chat about in a while called Exploiting Online Games. And it's about World of Warcraft and these massive multiplayer online role-playing games, MMORPGs, which have literally millions of subscribers. Okay, so... and, and we wrote a lot of code to break those games. Uh -huh. um, and so in, in the book, you'll see not only ideas about how the games break, but actually code that you can type into your own editor and compile yourself, and then you can run it against Warcraft, and it'll actually do interesting things. Okay, we get back to the, the book topic uh, pretty pretty soon. Let me okay. cover some, some general security topics. So if Absolutely. you would have to explain software security to, to a person, what where would you start? Which topics are most relevant? Uh, what is already what is the problem and what is already a solution when we talk about authorization, authentication, non-repudiation, right. and th yep. stuff like all, that? All I in, to my head. All in five minutes or less. So, so, um, so software security is about how to approach computer security if you are a developer or a software architect. And so the key to understanding security in my opinion, is having people who build our systems think carefully about security while they're building them. And there are a number of best practices that I've identified over the last decade working on this that I believe all developers and all software projects should take advantage of. There are seven touch points, I call them, which are these best practices. I'll give you an example of the top two touch points. One is using a static analysis tool, which is very much like, uh, works the same way as a compiler. You know, you run it against your code and in order to find security bugs in your code. And if you run a tool like that, it will find bugs like buffer overflows and simple race conditions and the kinds of small defects um, or bugs that people write in their code all the time because they just don't know any better. Um, C and C++ are particularly bad about having 
many, many ways to shoot yourself in the foot from a security perspective. And so we need these tools to help us identify places in the code where we've made a mistake. Uh, another touch point, an equally important touch point, is called architectural risk analysis. And the idea there is to look for higher level defects in your software system that happen at the design level. It just so happens that if you think about where defects are in software from a security perspective, it turns out that there are two major categories, bugs in the implementation and flaws in the design, and, it, and, and they, they chunk up about 50-50. So if you did a perfect job writing your implementation in C++, say, and you didn't have any security bugs, you could still have some big security flaws. For example, you might forget to authenticate the user at all, and that would be a design issue. And my practice and Microsoft's experience and everybody who's been working on this for the last decade, we all agree that, that we have to solve both the implementation problem and the architecture problem. And that's what my book, Software Security, is all about. So my company, Sigital, we have about 100 guys right now, and we do most of our work in North America. But we help very large corporations, um, especially in the financial vertical, like Morgan Stanley and Fidelity and other very large um, organizations, Qualcomm, to get a handle on the software security problem by teaching their developers. And believe it or not, some of these banks have 10,000 developers, like Morgan Stanley has 10,000 developers, um, teaching these guys about those best practices and teaching them what security bugs look like, showing them security exploits in living detail as we uh, have in our book, um, Exploiting Software, which is a hugely popular book, and and then um, changing the institution so that the software development life cycle has these best practices integrated into it. And really, that's, that's software security in a nutshell. It's something that um, people started practicing actively in right about 1998, and so you know, we've been doing it for about nine years. And I think a lot of developers have come to realize that if we want to tackle the security problem, a part of the job is going to have to be done by them. Okay, I guess also reviews are part of that because I might have uh, the feeling that I designed it right and, and secure, but uh, I, I need some other person's feedback maybe or trial to exploit it. To, to be really sure, how ca can I ever be sure that there is no flaw, no security uh, hole in, in there anymore? Yeah, so both architectural risk analysis and code review with a static analysis tool are kinds of review. Um, and the answer is that no, you cannot be 100% certain that you found all of the security problems. But if you do consider um, the code and you do consider the design in light of security, you're going to be a lot better off than if you just sort of willy-nilly ship code and don't think about security. And so though there's no guarantee, it's very clear that when it comes to um, certain kinds of software, in particular financial services software or software that controls, say, power plants or, or uh, uh, telecommunications or um, uh, transportation uh, devices, that that, that, that kind of software really needs to go through the security ringer. So we've done that kind of review for, geez, almost a decade now. There's a funny story, though. I, you know, I've broken many, many, many systems. I can't even begin to count the number over the years, um, me and my guys. And about 80% of the time when you go to a software team and you say, hey, we found a security problem in your system and uh, let us show it to you, <laughs> their reaction, even if they pay you to do it, their reaction will be, well, you're not supposed to do that. That's not allowed. You know, no user would ever actually do that. And we have to very carefully explain to them that we're the bad guy, right? <laughs> that we're not playing by the rules and that, yes, bad guys do, in fact, do stuff like this. And that's part of, uh, part of software security is getting people to understand how to think like a bad guy and why I wrote Exploiting Software, in fact, and also why I wrote um, Exploiting Online Games recently. What is one of the, the biggest security holes that you uh, discovered in the past? I think um, the biggest one I was involved with, uh, Microsoft had tried to build a special flag into their C compiler. 
in order to avoid buffer overflows. And uh, it was based on Crispin Cowan's stack guard idea. And so the idea was that you would um, keep an eye on the execution stack inside the machine. And if your little um, cookie got stomped on by somebody's buffer overflow, it would throw an exception. Well, the day that that system was released, uh, Microsoft had just been making a very big deal about software security. And, you know, Bill Gates had rented out half of San Francisco, and they talked about the Trustworthy Computing Initiative and all this stuff, and they were getting lots of press. And this was one of the first things that they released. Well, the day that it was released, we broke it. And we showed how you could um, ser- use the security mechanism itself to carry out a security attack. So that became a huge story I was on. Um, CNN, and that story went worldwide. And I actually was traveling, this is 2002, I was traveling to uh, Finland. And when I got to Finland, the Finnish press wanted to talk about it. So I did all these interviews with Finnish newspapers, and it was in the International Herald Tribune. And that story went worldwide. So I'd say that was probably the, the biggest one. Uh, needless to say, Microsoft wasn't too pleased um, with, <laughs> with that result. And, you know, to this day, I, I think they still are, are not very happy with me. But, oh, well, you know, they should just build better software, and then that wouldn't happen. You're not supposed to be friend with everybody as a security guy. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm glad you see it that way, Michael. I, I, I agree with you completely. <laughs> okay. So what is the first thing that you do when you try to break a software? Well, the first thing you do is you think like a bad guy, or you think like, somebody who really wants to understand how the system works and then determine what kind of assumptions that the designer of that system made. So to go back to the car example from before, you know, the assumption that the people who made that little car game had made was that nobody would take the cars apart and re-engineer the cars to be faster. And that that assumption turned out to be not a very good one. (laughs) And so, see, bad guys will take a look at a system and say, oh, look, they're assuming that the user will always put in a name. What if we put in a script instead? Or, look, they're assuming that, you know, input will only be uh, 300K or whatever. How about if we put in a terabyte and see what happens? And, and those are the sorts of things that you always try first. Now, you can do that in a very principled way in exploiting software we identified a whole bunch of things that we called attack patterns. And the attack patterns are, you know, 48 ways to think about things that attackers usually do when they see certain kinds of of software. And I think if you internalize some of those attack patterns, it helps you think like a bad guy in a more interesting way. One thing that came to my mind is uh, open source software might be more dangerous or uh, alluring more attacks because uh, guys like you, they, they can figure out from the source code where the weak points are and then try to attack exactly there. What What is your opinion there? Am I right that, or, that, or wrong? That turns out to be wrong, but you have many um, very good reasons for thinking it's right. So let me explain why it isn't. Um, it turns out that in order to carry out an attack against a piece of software, having the source code is certainly helpful but it is by no means necessary. And most people who do software exploit actually use the binary code, um, you know, as the target. And you wield things like decompilers and disassemblers, and you look at the stack as the machine is running, and, you know, you keep track of, you you use a lot of debuggers and and low-level things. And so um, in my experience, having the source code is, you know, not really a necessary thing. So um, it, it turns out that open source is in not really in any worse shape than any other kind of software because of the kind of tools that attackers use. Um, one other thing to note there, open source is also no better off from a security perspective because there's this theory that, you know, there are many eyes looking at it and so everybody will find the bugs and the bugs are transparent. But I believe that that's just complete, you know, baloney. Bullfeathers is what we call it over here. <laughs> okay, so uh, 
Let's get on uh, to your uh, latest book, uh, Exploiting Online Games. So mm -hmm. who is concerned with that? Like only the gamers or, or can you also uh, derive some lessons learned for, for everybody using the Internet? Oh, absolutely. There are lessons learned for everybody. Um, I learned a lesson in my career of writing all these books. And the lesson that I learned was when you write a book about how something breaks, everybody wants it and it, it's a bestseller. And when you write a book about how to do software security properly, it doesn't sell near as well. <laughs> <laughs> oh. So so if you want people to understand the software security problem and you want it to be widely understood, the only way to do that is to write about how things break. And I learned that lesson, you know, uh, more than once. And I can tell you that it's absolutely true. I call it the NASCAR effect. You know what NASCAR is? Yeah, Great I know NASCAR, US. but still explain. Well, people watch NASCAR, um, which is a kind of car racing, um, so they can see these guys crash their cars and sometimes die. Uh, <laughs> and that's why humans are interested in watching NASCAR. It doesn't have anything to do with car architecture or safety or you know actual races. It has mostly to do with spectacular crashes. Mm. And so I think that computer security shares things by analogy <laughs> yeah, philosophy. Sa sadly enough but but true yeah i, I can guess yeah yeah. yeah so so the the getting back to these online games these games have become hugely popular like there's one game called world of warcraft you've probably heard of it has eight million subscribers eight million people oh, wow. play that game on planet earth and they're on in every country, you know, there are two and a half million in China, a million and a half in the United States, lots and lots in Europe. And the, the, uh, the, the subscriber base is very large. And the, the world is available in many, many languages. Um, and as a result, because all these people are spending time playing a game, um, and it's, it's an adventure game. So you have characters and they get levels and you can gain experience points and you can find pretend gold and, you can buy virtual swords of heinosity and, you know, blunderbusses of flatulence and all sorts of other items. And it turns out that these pretend items have real economic value in the real world and that there are companies set up to buy those items from gamers and then sell them to other gamers, acting as a middleman. The biggest company um, that does that is called IGE. Because of this, you know, there's incentive to... Get, gain wealth in the game and have your character, you know, go as far as possible. Not just psychological incentive of having a cool character, but also real monetary incentive of, hey, I can sell this if I want. So because of that, as you might imagine, cheating is unbelievably rampant. All sorts of people cheat. Um, for example, you might want to have a program called a bot play your character for you while you sleep. So you set up a bot so that your character stands in front of a monster hole, and whenever a monster comes out, it kills it. And you come in the morning, and there's a big pile of gold and a bunch of dead monsters. And, you know, you were sleeping. <laughs> oh, amazing. Oh. <laughs> so so that's, that's one, of the, one of the examples um, from online games. Now, let's get technical for a minute here. The way that these games really work is by having a bank of central servers that are connected over the Internet to fat clients on PC. So the gamers each have their own PC, and on that is a big program that, you know, displays um, things about the world and the character and all that stuff. It's kind of your view into the universe. Well, as you can imagine, the Internet is not fast enough. It's not even fast enough for you and I to talk over Skype without jitter, right? <laughs> <laughs> right, we had that it's experience. Not, exactly. So it's, it's, not, it's also not fast enough to push all the possible state to all of the gamers at once because, you know, there, there may be 8 million subscribers, but about 500,000 people are playing this game at any one time. So right now, when you're listening to this podcast, there are half a million people playing World of Warcraft together. And, um, you know, the Internet's not fast enough for all this stuff to happen in perfect synchrony. So the way the designers have approached this problem is by taking a piece of the state of the universe, which is stored on these servers, and cracking it off and handing that state over to the client program, the game program on the, on the gamer's PC. Now, imagine 
that you know how computers work and all of a sudden you get all this state from the game on your own PC and you want to cheat. Well, there's some obvious things you can do. Like, let's find out what kind of state the game is providing me with. And here's a real example from World of Warcraft. The game keeps track of your character's location by allowing your game client on your PC to track those XYZ coordinates. And they're just stored in memory somewhere. So if you find out where those are stored, you can directly change those coordinates, not through walking or running or flying, but instead by just programmatically poking new values. And then those new values will be sent to the central server and your character will teleport across the universe. <laughs> Amazing. Whoa. It's awesome. It's really, it's really incredible. And as you can imagine, this ability to teleport throughout the universe becomes extremely useful in cheating and also in you know, fighting other players in player versus player combat or other monsters. <laughs> And we explain in the book, you know, how this works and actually show code to do that teleporting and ping-ponging and other, other techniques. So that, that's the now, – now here's why this is important. One more thing. The, these huge distributed systems with, you know, hundreds of thousands of users are exactly what we are setting out to build in SOA and Web 2.0 systems today. And so my belief as a computer scientist and, you know, a guy who does research in computer security is the, the kinds of problems around state and time that are very common in these games like World of Warcraft are exactly the kinds of problems we're going to see for a decade to come in all of this other software that we're building um, for SOA and Web 2.0 uh, systems. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. I see. <laughs> well. Wow. So uh, now that you tell me that there are security holes, the, the game companies, of course, they, they have already closed all the security holes. Or, or how, how fast do they react? Are they aware of the, the falls? The, the they're certainly holes? aware that people cheat. And their, their approach so far has been to um, try to determine when somebody's cheating and, and kick their character out of the game. And they do that by... Um, installing spyware in the case of World of Warcraft on your PC to watch what you're doing on your PC and not just what the game application is doing, but all sorts of other aspects of what's going on on your PC. So they know who you're connected to with your instant messenger. They know the names of all of your uh, windows that are open uh, or your, all your windows that have processes. And they, they know which DLLs are loaded and they, they send that information back to um, the server to determine whether or not you're cheating. Now, that kind of activity, in California at least, is certainly nowhere near legal. You can't install spyware on someone's machine, even if they said you can. You still can't. Um, but nobody's challenged that from a legal perspective in the United States yet. Um, but, but you can see that their approach so far has by and large been one of monitoring and trying to determine if people are cheating and if so, kicking them off um, the system. But it's a, it's a classic arms race. Um, I think many of the attacks and much of the code that we use in the book are already known. Um, and so you, you probably shouldn't use that code to cheat because if you do, you'll get your character banned off the game. What can I as an individual do, do about it? Just not yeah, they're, play they're, the game? Or, or does your book give me any advice on this? Yeah, it actually does. In the last chapter, we have uh, gamers security checklist that has 15 things on it that uh, gamers should think about um, and ask about their game. And so in the book, if you're a gamer, you can use that checklist to think about your own situation and determine what to do. There's also a lot of advice in the book for people who are designing and building these games. And in fact, we spent a fair amount of time talking to game developers about how to do a better job when you're designing a game. And so many of the things that we've pointed out could in fact be fixed in future games, which I believe is important. You know, because if you have games like Second Life, which I'm sure you've heard of. Yeah, um, that, well, there, that would have been the next question to ask. Second yeah, Life, what, what's about Second Life? Second Life, you know, in, in these games, um, Second Life, the guys at Linden Labs have decided that all of the virtual stuff that you build for your avatar belongs to you. 
Now, that's a lot different than most game companies because, you know, the game companies like World of Warcraft guys, the Blizzard guys, actually just license you, um, you know, your character and all your character stuff really still belongs to Blizzard. Um, but in Second Life, it belongs to you. Now, here's a funny legal situation. Get this. This is a real case going on right now in the U.S. court system. There was a guy in Pennsylvania who, by watching how Second Life worked, determined a way to, to use URL parameter tampering to um, bid for and win auctions on land that hadn't even been opened up yet. And he became a real estate baron in Second Life by doing this. Mm. And then he started you know, selling the land and renting it and doing all the other stuff because it was his land. Well, the Linden Labs guys found out that he had used parameter tampering, and so they took all of his land away, and they kicked him out of the game. And he said, wait a minute, that's not your land, that's my land, according to this legal situation, so I'm going to sue you. And so right now there's a lawsuit in court about this guy who used a bug in the code to gain property that he claims is his that they took away without any reason. And that's just very interesting. How it's going to come out? Who knows? You know, imagine you're the judge who's used to, you know, real-world stuff where somebody's cow destroyed somebody's fence, you know, and that's what he usually sees. And all of a sudden there's some guy who's mad because his pretend stuff was taken away by a game company. <laughs> oh, wow. This sounds all so far off, but, oh, I guess there is more to come in the future. Absolutely. It's incredibly fascinating. I had so much fun working on this book for the last year and a half, because every time I would think through an issue, it would have all these incredible facets, and it was just a complete blast to work on this thing. So I'm, I'm uh, really grateful to my co-author, Greg Hogland, that he conned me into doing it, because working on this work has just been really, really fun. So uh, what kind of advice do you have for the Second Life uh, people? I mean, you found this, uh, we, we just heard about this one uh, exploit, but what are other potential exploits are around for, for Second I, I Life? I mean, the, the, the biggest piece of advice is you should understand that your gamers, your users, are going to cheat. And you should disincentivize them from doing so. So you should, you should try to think in advance of how people are going to break your system and make it so that it's much harder to break um, than it might be otherwise. And that's you know, the number one piece of advice going back to what we were talking about in generic software security. Do things like code reviews, but more importantly, think very hard about time and state and do some architectural risk analysis to determine the kinds of attacks that attackers are very likely to carry out on your game system. And that's why I think, you know, exploiting online games for all of its coolness factor um, and, you know, for all of its great stories actually has very important lessons for um, technologists to think about from a software security perspective, which is another reason that I wrote the book. Okay, so could you give me some more examples of the concrete technical advices that, that you give? You mean for people that are building stuff or people yeah, that are for, breaking for stuff? Building, uh, for people who are building software, game software in this case. Yeah, well, here, here's a piece of technical advice that you can glean by only by reading the whole book. And that is, you know, any piece of state that you give to the gamer is very likely to be manipulated. And so you need to figure out an efficient way to compare the previous state from last time you got something from the gamer's PC to the current thing that they're asking for. And maybe you could use something as simple as, um, you know, momentum or inertia against a huge pile of data uh, and, and use some heuristics and techniques from AI to determine whether or not, you know, big orthogonal jumps in state space have occurred versus sort of smooth, um, you know, what you would expect kind of changes in state. That would be very, very, very helpful. But I'm not aware of any game that's doing that sort of thing right now. Okay, so you have something like a, a suggested idealistic architecture for them. I mean, where to keep state and thing like that, that, that is part of an architecture decision, right? That's right. It's part of an architecture decision. And so what you have to say is, well, as we design these future games, we need to think very carefully about the kind of architecture that we adopt. And, and I think the, the same lessons apply to, like I said before, SOA software and Web 2.0 software. 
where people are making these architecture decisions. For example, you know, the Google Desktop Search. Um, that suffered from a number of spectacular problems that look very similar to the time and state errors that we describe in the online games. And so sure enough, you know, here we go. The next set of problems that we experience in the software security world are going to be more about time and state and things like race conditions and lockout and bizarre situations because there's so much state to track than they are going to be about dumb things like cross-site scripting and buffer overflows and, and the software security problems of yesterday. Okay. So what is the next book? The, this book is out. What is the next book that you're working on? Oh, you're <laughs> terrible. <laughs> you're already making me do the next book. I haven't even had fun with this one yet. So it just got released last week. I'm, I'm actually working on um, a book that's going to take a long time to write uh, about uh, security principles, like the, the principle of least privilege or uh, the principle of careful error handling. And I'm trying to demonstrate those principles, which are abstract philosophical things, um, using real code so that people who are, you know, real, honest-to-God, hardcore coders can begin to understand some of the architectural issues um, that they need to think about while they're designing their programs. Uh, that's, and, you know, that's interesting. It's going to take a while to get that one done, but it, it'll be cool when it's done. Yeah, no, I've... I've been involved in the patterns community quite heavily, so I I wonder whether how how close this gets to to patterns actually. Principles are are like behind patterns; they are the basic foundation, and then the concrete mm -hmm. uh, design uh, solutions that that typically work that that show that they uh, work that prove that they then become uh, patterns. Will will you express patterns in there or or stay at the principles level? Um, I want to I want to go from principles to code, and we may go through patterns if we need to. But I do want to say one thing: um, a lot of people that first think about software security that have, that are good programmers and designers often think that software security must be about features and functions and things and stuff. Like if I just add cryptography, then I'll take care of all the security issues. Well, um, what I've been explaining over the last while that we've been talking is that security is much more than features and functions and stuff and things. Security is really much more like quality. It's much more about building something that's solid, that will stand up under attack, and making sure it's as defect-free as possible. And so that's a critical, critical lesson. So I want to show people in this book not just a set of patterns that you can use to do the right sort of functions, like if you're thinking about how to do authentication right, yes. but also how to avoid common mistakes that people make in designs when they're maybe doing authentication, just as an example. Yeah, sounds, sounds exciting. When, when can I have it, you said? <laughs> in, in next year, <laughs> around that time? You really are a taskmaster, Michael. <laughs> I'm, not, I'm making no promises. You know, that, that, that work is just barely underway and you know I, I need some time to rest and have a fun time with exploiting online games because that one's so new and it's so exciting so. yeah I, I just wanted to tease you so <laughs> <laughs> great so any final words you want to say any message to our listeners well I, my final word is that I'm I'm hugely optimistic about software security There are a lot of people who express a lot of pessimism about security, and they say, oh, woe is us, we're never going to solve these problems, we should all just despair and stick our heads in the sand and maybe even you know, flip burgers for a living instead of work on software. But I'm not like that. I think that we, over the last 10 years since I've been working on software security, have made huge amounts of forward progress, and that... I think the time has come that most people who are building systems understand that they need to worry about security. They're just not quite sure what to do yet. And so the time of teaching people how to do the right stuff from a security perspective is now. And I'm very excited to be helping to lead the charge in teaching people how to do this stuff. So I'd say, you know, the final word is I'm optimistic about the progress we've made and I want everybody to help. So come help. <laughs> <laughs> Great. Thanks, Gary. You're absolutely welcome. That was really fun, Michael.
Thanks for listening to Software Engineering Radio. If you want to get more information about Software Engineering Radio or if you want to give us feedback, please go to our website at se-radio.net. You can also contact the team at team at se-radio.net, although we prefer entries in our comments system on the website so other people can see what you think. Software Engineering Radio wants to thank Henning Pauli for the intro and outro music, as well as Lipson for providing the bandwidth. This episode of SE Radio, as well as all other episodes, is licensed under Creative Commons license. See the Software Engineering Radio website for details.